In 2016, there was a relentless barrage of reports on drug-related killings. People, mostly poor, were shot in broad daylight, in front of their homes, some even while asleep with their families. Bodies were mangled, desecrated, and left in the streets, creating shockwaves of fear among communities. The phrase extrajudicial killings, or EJK, became vernacular parlance. Watching this spectacle of terror night after night, I felt a deep unease welling in me. Why wasn't I feeling anything? What happened to my conscience, my capacity to feel? As an artist whose lifeblood is built on empathy and engagement, I feared that my very heart had deserted me. I had to do something. Maybe it was despair, maybe I was desensitized, but whatever the reason for the gaping emptiness I felt, I knew I had to confront it and find my center again. Of course, what can I do but turn to art? I called my friend Maynard Manansala, a playwright, and together we found ourselves with the mothers, the children, the widows and orphans of the so-called war on drugs. I wanted to hear their stories for myself. Passing reports of how and when their lives were brutalized did not suffice. I was interested in conversation. I wanted to listen to their hearts as a way of listening to mine. In the face of unspeakable violence, I wanted to know, how do we feel? How can we cope? What can we do to assuage, to survive, and perhaps to fight back? How can we restore the dignity and humanity, not just from the victims and their families, but from all of us fellow citizens who bear witness daily to mass murder and impunity? Slowly, I realized if I can bring these conversations to more people who are willing to share that transformative experience, then there, there in the process is my living, loving heart as an artist. Surrender, surrender, tajak, tajak. Surrender, surrender, tajak, tajak. True enough, as we translated these stories into narratives and performances, I felt myself transformed into a medium inhabited by the stories of all those who can barely carry the burden of what they had to go through. Una nilang binarel si Papa. Kinarangan ko naman si Mama ko eh. Kaya lang tinulak ako nung isang lalaki. On the stage of Taupo, only one body is visible. Mine. But it is not just me who is speaking. In the play, and now in this film, you will hear the anguished hearts of a whole country, my own included. The most important thing about Taopo for me is not the performance itself. Rather, it is the conversation that happens afterwards. In the talk box after every staging, I can feel how the play is able to transform the consciousness of those who partake in the experience. After a performance in Baguio, a grandmother apologized for being unaware of what was happening in her own backyard. In Berlin, a young woman, herself a drug user, lamented how lucky she was to be living in a country that treated those like her as people who deserve a second chance. Back home, she may as well be just another corpse on the street. I thought, I had already been desensitized. Okay. Through now, art, I am able to foster an environment where people listen, share, and find meaning. In this way, our lives intertwine, and slowly, we heal, we build our strength. From 2016 until now, Taopo has been an ongoing conversation and I hope to sustain that conversation for as long as it is necessary. This play has changed the way I create art and the way I live my life. The infamy, the indignation, the thirst for attention, recognition, 
influence and perceived success. All these fall away. The journey of Tao Po is also my journey as an artist. Now, my life is my message. The people who generously share their stories with us are not just mere subjects for a play. Outside of the stage, beyond this film, they are as much a part of my life now as I am in theirs. Our lives are linked by the shared quest for justice, for human rights in the face of human wrongs. We carry each other, and what keeps us going is love. I am May Paner. I used to introduce myself as an artist. Now, I prefer to say, Tao.